All right, so we, we're still in the taxonomy unit here. So we're going through our groups. We've done pretty much all the kingdoms except for one. And that last one is the one we're going to start today, and that's the animal kingdom. Okay. And so we've talked about archaea. We talked about bacteria, protists, fungi, plants. Now we're moving into animals. So what are the characteristics of animals? The general characteristics that all animals have. What's one thing, Joe, to reproduce next to um, Well, some can do both. So not quite. So we call them heterotrophs, multicellular, they're eukaryotes. So multicellular, eukaryotic, heterotrophs. I know we're all familiar with different types of animals, but animals have evolved many types of body plans, many ways of living, of acquiring nutrition, and so forth. There's a wide variety of types of animals. We kind of split them into major groups okay, of animals with backbones and without backbones. That's the sort of classic division. So vertebrates are animals with a backbone, and invertebrates are animals without a backbone. Raise your hand if you can tell me. Vertebrate or invertebrate? Dean? Vertebrate. Vertebrate. Grady? Invertebrate. Invertebrate. Carter? Invertebrate. Invertebrate. We'll get that one mixed up a lot. Let's keep it with that. Jake? Vertebrate. Vertebrate. Some more. Francesca? Vertebrate. Yes, the snake is a vertebrate. They do have a backbone. In fact, almost their whole body is their vertebrae. Okay. What's that? Isn't it kind of like Well, vertebrae are individual small little bones all sort of stacked one after the other. That's what vertebrae are. Yep. About the crab. Some people confuse this. Crab? Invertebrate. Invertebrate. Yep, they, they don't have a backbone. They do have a skeleton, it's called an exoskeleton. Starfish, Francesca? Invertebrate. Invertebrate. Last class, a lot of people were a little iffy on this. Group Dean? Invertebrate. Which one? Invertebrate. Uh, no. Really? Invertebrate. Ants and all other insects are in the same um, phylum with this crab. They have an exoskeleton, but they don't have a backbone. So if they use a skeleton, they die. So if they usually yes. yeah. All animals that have an exoskeleton are in the How about this mouse? People, I remember somebody once told me because they can fit into really small areas that mice have no bones. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever heard that? No? Okay. Uh, vertebrate or invertebrate? Come on. <coughs> vertebrate. Uh, salamander. <coughs> it? It is one of those. <laughs> vertebrate. A slug? Slug? Invertebrate? What is that? these invertebrates, one of the things we look at to put them into one of the phylum that they belong in is their symmetry. And I know you guys have probably talked about symmetry in maybe math class, right? We talk about the symmetry of different shapes. Okay. Um, symmetry has to do with the arrangement of the parts of an organism when we're talking in biology. 
Okay. And there's really sort of three categories that we can put an organism into. Asymmetrical, or has asymmetry, bilateral symmetry, or radial symmetry. What do you think asymmetry means? Asymmetric. Okay. One side looks like exactly like the other side. That's another one, actually. That's not asymmetry. Joey? Uh, it's like not symmetric. Yeah. A, when you put like the letter A before as a prefix, it means sort of not. Yeah, there's no real pattern. There's no symmetry. You couldn't draw a line really anywhere on that organism, dividing it into equal parts. Here is a shape that is asymmetrical. How about bilateral symmetry? Bi means what? Two. How about lateral? Do you know what that means? Something else. It means side. Two sides. No. If? Yeah, basically you have a. Um, an organism in which if you draw a line splitting in half, they would basically be mirror images of each other, have the same arrangement of parts. There's two basically equal parts. Now it doesn't have to be perfect, right? If it's, you know, if you're talking about a human, like maybe one arm is slightly longer than the other, then still they have step person, so it's bilateral symmetry. Okay. It's the overall general arrangement of the parts of an organ. And now we have radial symmetry. So radial, what shape would you measure the radius of? A circle. A circle. This is circular symmetry. It's when an organism has its parts arranged in a circular sort of pattern. Okay, so the petals of a flower, that's radial symmetry. Okay, they're organized around a circular pattern. And usually in, a, in circ, um, radial symmetry, there are several lines that could be drawn, splitting that organism into equal parts. So, bilateral symmetry for the beetle, the sea anemone, and radial symmetry where the tentacles are all coming out from a central point, like spokes on a wheel. And then that sponge has asymmetry. All right, let's look at some other examples. How about Mr. Whiskers here? Type of symmetry. Great? Uh, bilateral. bilateral. Yes. Basically, if you look, it's two equal sides. This one trips people up sometimes. How about this <coughs> spider? Taylor? Radio? Yeah, that's what sometimes people say, but it's actually not radial. Right? It's bilateral. It's bilateral. Why isn't it radial? I mean, it sort of seems like maybe its legs are radial, but. Come on? Yeah, if we drew a line sort of crosswise, we'd have the head and the thorax separate, and then the abdomen on the bottom, and not quite equal parts. So yeah, that is bilateral symmetry. How about this amoeba? Now, it's not an animal, first of all, so probably shouldn't really be on this list, but it is a um, living organism. What type of symmetry, Jake? Asymmetry. Yeah, that's asymmetry. It has no, no pattern. <coughs> you know what organism this is? Not just a ball of spikes. It's the sea urchin. What type of symmetry do they have? If you ever look closely at the pattern of those sort of spikes? Right, Jessica? Radial? Yeah, it's radial symmetry. They're all this sort of circular pattern. We saw this organism on Friday. What was it? That's a planaria. Mean people cut it in half. <laughs> what type of symmetry does the planaria have? 
Carter? Oh, bilateral. Bilateral. You know what this is? Oh. Or shoe grab. Type of symmetry. It's not a lollipop. Jake? Bilateral. Bilateral. How about the sand dollar? Katie? Radial. Yeah, radial symmetry. Again, it's hard to sort of radiating out from the central part. Yeah, things with radial symmetry also have bilateral symmetry, but they have additional lines of symmetry which make them radial. And uh, finally, this um, starfish, right? It's also radial symmetry. All right, so let's talk about invertebrates in general. So again, these are animals without a backbone or a spinal column. So when we talked about, we were talking about the kingdoms. Animals make up the most number of different identified species. But out of the animals, what percent would you guess of the, per, of the the known identified species of animals, what percent of them are invertebrates? Aiden? What? 30. 30%? So I think insects take up like 70%. Okay. So in total, like 80. Okay. No? 90. 90? Uh, 60. 60, okay. Um, you guys are close. 95%. So out of all of the named species, 95% are inverted. Even though, you know, if I ask you to think of an animal, chances are you're thinking about like a big furry mammal. Right? But actually, most animals are invertebrates. And they go from things that are really simple, like a sponge, to things that are much more complex. And so when we talk about taxonomy of animals, vertebrates, all of the vertebrates are in a single phylum. You know what it was called? All vertebrates, including us, are in one phylum. What's it called? Yeah, thanks. thanks. This is a real fortune, and uh, what's the actual answer? I got it. Yeah, so let me say chordates. Chordates. So animals, chordates, include all the animals with backbones, backbones and a spinal cord, chordate. The inverts actually have many phyla which they are in. So all vertebrates. Okay. All vertebrates are. Um, classified in a whole host of different phyla. What we're going to do is talk about each phylum sort of one by one. We'll talk about just some general characteristics um, and some examples, some things you may be familiar with, and uh, one at a time. So we'll start with the very simplest of invertebrates. It's called phylum porifera. These are sponges, and you may not have ever thought of this as an animal, but you know, this sponge, this is a, a natural sponge. You can probably buy one at like Bath and Body Works, right, for five bucks or something. You might call it a loofah. It actually is the skeleton of a once living animal. I'll pass this around. And sponges, they attach themselves to the bottom of, you know, rocks or an ocean. And what they do is they bring in water through all these tiny holes, pores. That's where the name porifera comes from. And as the water comes in, they filter out little bits of um, food, you know, bacteria, protists, tiny little animals, little bits of plant, and that's what they use as their food. We call things like that filter feeder, where they suck in water, filter out little bits of stuff out of it, and then um, release the water. You guys can pass that around. It's kind of still squishy, even though it's many years old. It's kind of squishy. If I put this in water, it would suck up lots of the water. A sponge like at your kitchen sink, like a neon, pink sponge and a little rectangle. That's not an actual living sponge. That's a synthetic sponge. But you know, they sell these sometimes 
people use them in watercolor painting. Uh, if you ever had a hermit crab, usually have a little natural sponge in there that you put water in to keep it hydrated. You take a bath, you can wash yourself up with a sponge, you know. But it is a skeleton you can pass around of a once living animal. They are, have asymmetry, so obviously if you look at that, it has no real pattern to its organization, it has asymmetry. They come in a huge variety of shapes, sizes, colors. There's all sorts of different types of sponges. Here are some examples. But they all basically are marine organisms. They're all filter feeders. Um, and they are very simple animals. They don't have any organs. They don't have any organ system. Okay? They have just very simple levels of organization. So phylum periphera are the sponges. Eh? Which, which Um, probably this type, because it has more, more pores in them, and they're smaller. All right, the next phylum is phylum nidarian. starts with a C, a silent C, nidarian. And these include um, tentacled animals that have radial symmetry. Um, jellyfish are in this phylum. Sea anemones. The hydro we looked at on Friday. Coral. All these things are nidarians. And on their tentacles, they have special cells. They're called nematocysts. And they're stinging cells. And basically, that these stinging cells, they shoot out sort of a little, um, a little part that goes into the organism they're preying on. It has um, toxins in it, which basically paralyze the prey so that these um, nidarians can then consume it in radial symmetry. So the hydra we saw on Friday, that was a very, very small freshwater nidarian. Had tentacles, and you saw those tentacles in action, killing the daphnia and immobilizing them to be consumed. Jellyfish, you know, jellyfish um, live in the oceans. And they have the jelly part, allows them to float. But then they have tentacles that they use for capturing food. And you know, you have to be aware of them if you're at the beach in the ocean swimming. Some areas, there's a lot of, of jellyfish. And those tentacles can sting you. Has anyone ever gotten a jellyfish sting before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right yeah. Hurts, right? Yeah, so what's happening, when, if you do get stung by a jellyfish, probably you didn't notice it was next to you. It's tentacles, maybe touched your skin, wrapped around your arm or something, and those nematocysts, they shot a little sort of um, harpoon into your skin, and in that was this, these chemicals that cause that burning sensation. Now, it's not enough to, to really hurt, I mean, it hurts, but not enough to really damage you in any way, um, the type of jellyfish you've probably been around. And so, um, do you know what sort of an old wives' tale is about yeah. yeah, and when I was a kid in Florida, um, I was with my friend, their two brothers, and one of them got stung by a jellyfish. So his brother, right there in the beach, peed on his leg. Um, <laughs> did not take away the sting, because that's actually not true. Peeing on the um, sting of a jellyfish will not help it to feel better. Uh, usually if you're in an area where jellyfish are common and, and people get stung re um, regularly, at like a lifeguard station, usually what they'll have is a spray bottle with a vinegar or something in it. And the acid and the vinegar will sort of neutralize some of that sting. Uh, they tell you you should use like a credit card or a piece of plastic to like scrape away the stinger. Because those nematocysts are likely still in your skin and you can scrape them out. They're really small, but you can scrape them out with like a credit card or something and spray it with vinegar to help the sting. Uh, there are some types of jellyfish with very um, strong toxins in their nematocysts that can actually kill a person. Um, box jellyfish, for example. Wait, what's in the, like, the jelly? Is that like It's not, because it's not one single cell, but it's yeah, basically just mostly water. Um, but yeah, they use that to float around. Some jellyfish are bioluminescent, especially the ones that live deep in the ocean where there's no light. They produce their own light using chemical reactions like a firefly to attract mates or attract predators and so forth. This is a sea anemone. And the sea anemone, the tentacles, 
have those nematocysts. However, the clownfish, you know anything about that? Nemo. Yeah. I know you've seen Nemo. <laughs> but those staying cells, why wasn't Nemo killed when he was inside the sea anemone? Uh, yeah, they are um, resistant to the sting of the sea anemones, and they actually have evolved a mutually beneficial relationship with the sea anemone. The clownfish, because it's not, it's resistant to those stings, can hide in the tentacles of the anemone and be protected from predators. Because predators are not going to go in there, they're going to get stung. Um, the clownfish brings in little bits of food that the sea anemone actually consumes as its food source, so they have a, a mutualistic relationship. They come in lots of colors and sizes, and you know sometimes you see them, like we go to South Carolina each year, and during spring break, and we see them all the time washed up on the beach, and you know, we can pick up the jelly bar and look at them, and it's kind of neat. All right. Echinoderm, phylum echinodermata. What does derm mean? Like a dermatologist, epidermis, skin. Echino means spiny. These are the name means spiny skin. And the echinoderms, um, many are filter feeders. They only have one body opening, like the nidarians, where food goes in, but waste also exits that one body opening. The echinoderms, oh, and the um, nidarians had radial symmetry. I don't know if I mentioned that. So do the echinoderms, radial symmetry. And it includes things like these sand dollars. So sand dollar, you may have seen the beach or maybe you went to the shell store and there's a sand dollar. Those are actually the skeletons, the remains of animals, just like the sponge is the remains, remaining skeleton of an animal. Same thing with sand dollar. They're alive, they're animals, they, they move pretty slowly. Sand dollars are filter feeders. This video just shows, this is a time-lapse video. So this is not how fast they actually move, but you can see maybe you can tell. Or not. Um, but they just move in this sort of circular pattern real slowly, filtering out little bits of organic matter from the sand, that's what they consume. Sea urchins, those spikes, those are uh, kinoderms. Starfish. Are kind of um, and starfish are neat. Starfish, like some other invertebrates, have pretty strong ability to regenerate. Um, on a starfish, in the middle portion, there's this area here, it's a little darker in this picture if you can see it. That's called the central disc of the starfish. And if you cut the arm of a jellyfish off, if it has part of that central disc still intact, it can grow back the rest of the starfish. Okay? Or if you cut one of these arms of the starfish off, a new one would grow. They can regenerate. You know, the story that I've heard is that fishermen sometimes would catch starfish in their nets when they're fishing and be mad, and so chop them up and throw them back in the ocean, thinking they're getting rid of them. But what they're really doing is um, encouraging the asexual reproduction of those starfish, because each part that they chopped up that had that central disc is going to grow into a new starfish. Um, starfish move around, and these little things on the bottom are called two feet. Okay, this helps them to move. Now, the worms is not one phylum. There's actually three phylum phyla of worms. There's Annelida, which are the segmented worms. There's Nematoda, which are round worms. And there's Platyhelminthes, which are flat worms. Okay. Um, but we're just kind of lumping them together. So worms are pretty interesting. Um, worms, some are free living, but there are a whole bunch of parasitic worms that are interesting to uh, talk about. This is probably one that you're most familiar with, an earthworm. So it's a segmented worm, an annelid. If you look closely at an earthworm, you know it has all those little stripes on it. Each of those is a section. That's why it's called a segmented worm. Earthworms are hugely important for the soil, because what do they do? How are earthworms helpful? Like you could actually buy online a bag of earthworms. They get shipped to your house. You can dump them in your garden. I mean, some people do that. What's the benefit? Dean? Just they break down some. Don't they break down compost? Yeah, basically, those earthworms, as they burrow through the soil, first of all, they aerate the soil because their tunnels allow oxygen to get in. But they consume the soil. 
And what they do is they digest little bits of organic matter from the soil, little bits of leaves and waste and, and dead plants and animals. And then as they go to the bathroom, okay, they sort of recycle those nutrients. Um, when they do go to the bathroom, probably have seen this before, they, they produce what are called earthworm castings. If you ever have seen like some bare patch of soil where there's no grass growing, you see little round clumps of what you thought was mud, right? And you could smush them in your finger and they just kind of break up or you could pick them up, throw them at your friend. It's not mud. You know what I'm talking about, yeah, right? You've seen them. Yeah. yeah. That's earthworm they call castings or earthworm poop. And so that's what you're picking up and smushing in your fingers and throwing around those little clumps. Yeah. Those little, what, those little piles that you thought. How else do little piles get on the, on the soil? Where did you think they came from? I thought they were just like, you know. That like soil. bubbled up they into a little. Yeah. No, I thought they were just there. I thought maybe it's one of these steps. I never thought about it. Now well, that's earthworm poop that you're putting. Smushing between your fingers. Wait, what's those like in the soil? Those little like white things. That yeah. Soil. I've never known what those are. Like yeah. Yeah. I've always been wondering. I don't know. No, yeah. like, no, like when you buy soil. Oh, that's just it's on like styrofoam. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's actually it's actually to um, increase like the uh, or decrease the density to allow for more filtration of water. But it's styrofoam. Yeah, I know. Um, so another type of annelid related to segmented worms is a leech. Leeches are interesting. They live in fresh water often, and they're parasitic um, segmented worms, and they live off of what? Blood. They prey usually on you know, fish, amphibians, some reptiles. Um, and basically, they um, this part is called the back sucker. That just let, hold, lets them hold on to their prey. The narrow end is actually where they feed from. That's the, that's the head end of the leech. And they bite their prey. And their saliva has special compounds in it that prevent the blood from coagulating. So the animal they bit will continue to bleed. The leech will um, fill up its stomach with blood from that animal it's preying on. Once it's completely filled, it will basically detach, just kind of float to the bottom of the pond and lay there nice and full with blood and digest it. And it um, can live for a long time off of one blood meal is what it's called because you know they're relatively small, they're cold-blooded, they don't need that much nutrition. So they prey on um, whatever they're preying on. And they're specific, you know, sir, there's lots of species of leeches. Some only um, prey on frogs, and some only prey on um, turtles, and so forth. Yes? They just swim, like they swim, they like swim through the water. Like. Yeah, we're going to talk more about that. But yeah, they use, leeches have been used in medicine. Um, in you know medieval times, people believed that um, removing some blood from a person was healthy, called bleeding somebody, and they would sometimes use leeches to do that. Um, you ever see the movie Stand By Me, the old like oh my God. Yeah. 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 The scene where So how about like five people, how many people have seen the movie Stand By Me? Well, a few of you. Last class, nobody saw it. Nobody ever heard of it. It looked at me like I was crazy. It's about, a, it's a, based on a Stephen King, you know, a Stephen King novel. Um, but anyway, a group of kids, they find a dead body. It's what they do. But I mean, one scene from that movie is they go in the like, lake, and a, a pond, they come out, and they have leeches all over them. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, those are leeches. You know, they, they don't bite people very often because, um, you know, as soon as you come out of the water, you would notice, you would just pull it off. It's not going to really hurt you in any way. Um, in fact, if, it, if you did let a leech bite you and then took it off, the, where it bit you, it would continue to bleed for a while. Like, it wouldn't stop bleeding like a normal cup would because as they bite, they have some of that anticoagulant, so you just continue to bleed. Don't they also they still use it for, like, as a blood thinner? Yeah, we're going to talk about that on Wednesday. So, yep, you're right. They, do are, they are still used in certain situations in medicine. We saw this one. That's the planaria. That's the one. Yeah, you guys caught me. We need people. Um, they can regenerate. 
Uh, this is another type of worm. This is a uh, heartworm. So if you have a dog, every few months you may give it heart guard, oh, yeah. those little rectangular, they look like a dog tree. That's yeah. a medicine. It's a medicine that will prevent your dog from getting this worm. So this is from a dog who died of heartworm. And all of this stuff that looks like string is the worm inside of the dog's heart. Wow. Heartworm is a parasitic worm that gets into the circulatory system. It lives off of the blood of an animal. And as it grows and reproduces, it becomes so numerous, it can clog up the heart and stop the heart from functioning properly. It can kill an animal. Um, so that's another example. Here's, there are many types of parasites that will affect humans as well. This is a person's foot. You can see their toes down here. This is a disease called elephantitis. No, that's a different thing. So this is um, elephantitis is caused by a type of worm that gets into people's body in the water. And it lives in a person's lymphatic system. Our lymphatic system redistributes fluid around our body. So this worm gets in there and it clogs it up so the fluid in our body can't go back into circulation, start to accumulate in the lower extremities and the person's feet and calves and legs swell up. This is actually a moderate picture. When we get to the human body system unit, there's some pictures of extreme cases of elephantitis. Hold on, this is a fluke. It's um, not parasitic, it's another type of flatworm. So humans can get other types of worms as well. Pets can get them. My dog, one time she was going to the bathroom out in the backyard and I looked down at the little present that she left me. And on top of that little pile was a tiny little thing about the size of a grain of rice squirming around. It was, she had tapeworm. A single medication can clear it up. Um, another story I have for, I think we have one more minute. When we got our, our other dog, we got her very young. Usually when you adopt a dog, you get a dog from a breeder, you get them eight to 10 weeks, maybe. Um, and they've had their deworming already. But we got our dog really early. I think she was six weeks old. And she hadn't been dewormed. Basically, all puppies are infected with parasitic worms soon after birth through their mother, through their environment. And so usually before birth, they give them to their family, they deworm them. We, our dog wasn't dewormed, so we had to give her the medication. And it was just one pill. But after we gave her that pill, she was only about this big. Every time she went to the bathroom, it looked like a plate of spaghetti every time because there were all of these worms inside of her and that's what the deworming medication does it kills those worms and they come out some of them were well longer than her whole body they were they were this long for a dog that was, was this big um, so it's pretty pretty gross like for the what if like you stuck it's not like a it's not like a <laughs> vessel of fluid nothing would happen it wouldn't like come spraying out 